I have the pleasure of introducing Kelly Woodruff in, in a, uh, Kelly is a pediatric nurse practitioner with Norton Children's Endocrinology. She received her nursing degree from the University of Louisville and graduate degree from Indiana University. Kelly has been a nurse for over 40 years and enjoys following children from birth to college years. Our second speaker is Maggie Mangino. Maggie is an ambulatory wellness clinical pharmacy specialist at Norton Healthcare. She obtained her doctor of pharmacy degree from the University of Kentucky and completed a pharmacy residency at the University of Louisville Hospital. In 2011, after working in the community for a few years, Dr. Mangino returned to Norton Healthcare to lead its Rx for Better Health, which is a disease management program for employees and their family members who have diabetes. She is helping participants maintain or improve their health while reducing the risk for complications of diabetes. All, all relationships uh, have been successfully mitigated and none were disclosed for this. I do want to thank both of these um, speakers today and for all the, the work they've done to take care of patients within our community and within our system. So I'm gonna hand it over to Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Today we're going to talk about uh, type 2 diabetes and updates in the pharmacological guidelines um, according to the ADA 2022 standards of care. And of course, as Katie mentioned, Maggie and I both have uh, no disclosures today. The objectives for today's talk are to describe the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes, list the diagnostic approaches for identifying type 2 diabetes, review some of the pharmacologic treatment options in diabetes care, and apply evidence-based recommendations in patient cases. I'm going to review a little bit of pathophysiology, and Maggie will go into detail the latter part of this presentation about use of the medications that we will discuss. First of all, let's talk about the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, as we know, is a condition with autoimmune destruction of the beta cells. Type 2 diabetes has kind of a dynamic duo of issues involved where you have progressive loss of beta cell insulin secretion along with worsening insulin resistance in the body. You can also have diabetes due to other causes, such as monogenic diabetes syndromes, uh, otherwise known as MODI, uh, cystic fibrosis-induced diabetes, drug-induced diabetes, post-surgical, and pancreatitis-induced diabetes. In type 2 diabetes, as I mentioned before, you have several uh, systems um, not working correctly that lead to the progression to hyperglycemia. You have impaired insulin secretion through a dysfunction in the pancreatic beta cell, as well as impaired insulin action in the body through the pathway of insulin resistance. What happens is eventually the beta cell mass will undergo transformation to increase the insulin supply. And this concentration typically is increased relative to the severity of insulin resistance. In genomic wide association studies, they have shown over 50 gene loci linked to type two diabetes. And I can remember hearing about the first one identified, which is the PPARY gene. Also, what's very important to realize when you're looking at pathophysiology and type 2 diabetes is that it has a high genetic um, inheritance pattern and a high twin concordance rate. And I can verify that in our pediatric population, our type 2 diabetes patients, almost everyone will have a first degree relative that has type 2 or has had a history of gestational diabetes. This slide represents um, some of the beginning of the pathogenesis involved in developing hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetes. You can see that on the right of the slide in the purple circle, it starts with beta cell dysfunction, and then you have increasing insulin resistance in the body through mechanisms um, with um, environmental uh, exposures or environmental changes, such as decreased en energy expenditures, such as sedentary lifestyles, increased caloric intake, poor nutrients, 
in utero environmental factors, such as children that are born small for gestational age or IUGR. We have um, microbiome studies going, we have exposure to environmental chemicals. So the, the, the combination of environmental factors plus genetic factors um, predispose you to the development of type two diabetes. This is a nice slide that I occasionally will review with families in the clinic, um, looking at, again, the pathogenesis of the combination of reduced pancreatic insulin production, as well as increased insulin resistance. And on the right side of the slide in the rectangle area, it shows all of the additional factors that come into play that influence beta cell dysfunction and insulin resistance. And that what happens as the insulin secretion uh, is reduced and the insulin resistance is increased, it creates a vicious circle where they just continue to make um, the whole situation worse. This slide, I think most of all of us have seen, it's the ominous octet. And this is another slide that's very important when you're looking at pharmacological treatment for type two diabetes, because it demonstrates all of the various pathways that come together to affect hyperglycemia and how medications have been developed over the years to uh, improve glucose control at each level of these pathways. So for example, you have decreased incretin effects in the gut, increased lipolysis in the fat cells, increased glucose reabsorption in the kidney, decreased glucose uptake in skeletal muscle, changes in brain and nervous system neurotransmitter levels, increased hepatic glucose production, and decreased insulin and increased glucagon at the pancreas level. And all of these factors work together to give you hyperglycemia. Let's talk a little bit about diagnosis and screening. This slide is very familiar to all of us. It talks about uh, the various modalities available for screening and diagnosis of diabetes in general. We have an A1C, a fasting plasma glucose, a two-hour plasma glucose on an uh, OGTT using a 75 gram glucose load and a random plasma glucose. And I will go into a little bit more detail about these levels when we talk about diagnosis. But these are the typical, most commonly uh, seen screening modalities for diabetes. This is table 2.3. It's taken from the ADA 2022 Diabetes Standards of Care, and it reviews criteria for screening for diabetes or prediabetes in asymptomatic adults. Testing should be considered in adults with overweight or obesity, and these are defined as a BMI greater than or equal to 25 or greater than or equal to 23 in Asian Americans who also have one or more of the following risk factors, a first degree relative with diabetes, a high risk race or ethnicity, history of cardiovascular disease, hypertension defined as a blood pressure greater than 140 over 90 or already on therapy for hypertension, HDL cholesterol less than 35 and or triglyceride greater than 250, women with PCOS, physical inactivity, lifestyle, and other clinical conditions associated with insulin resistance, such as severe obesity and acanthosis. Also recommended for screening are patients with prediabetes, and there are the definitions, and they should be screened yearly. Women who were diagnosed with gestational diabetes should have lifelong testing at least every three years. For all other patients, testing should begin at age 35. And if the results are normal, they recommend screening again at three-year interval. And then patients with HIV should also be screened. And again, how is, how is it best to screen? And these are the most common modalities. A fasting blood sugar, a hemoglobin A1C, a two-hour glucose, oral glucose tolerance test using a 75-gram glucose load. Let's move on and talk about diagnosis. Again, everyone has seen this information as well. If you're looking at an A1C as your screening or diagnostic criteria, normal A1C is five, about five. Prediabetes is defined as an A1C of 5.7 to 6.4%, and diabetes is an A1C of 6.5% or greater. If you use fasting plasma glucose as your screening or diagnostic modality, Normal would be less than 100. Prediabetes is defined as a fasting plasma glucose of 100 to 125, and diabetes would be 126 or greater, and that's on two separate occasions. 
if you're using your oral glucose tolerance test, a normal result is a two hour mark of less than 140. Prediabetes would be 140 to 199, also known as impaired glucose tolerance, and diabetes would be 200 or greater. And if you have overt symptoms of diabetes, such as hyperglycemia, I mean, excuse me, such as polydipsia, polyphasia, um, polyuria, um, and a random greater than 200, um, that can be diagnostic as well. Other important considerations, especially uh, in pediatric world where I work, is to obtain your pancreatic autoantibodies as well. That would be your GAD65 antibodies, insulin autoantibodies, and islet cell antibodies. Um, presence of antibodies in can indicate type 1 more so than type 2. Other considerations when you're diagnosing, of course, are your fasting lipid panels and looking at your triglycerides, HDL and LDL, a CMP to look at your liver enzymes and blood pressure monitoring. And then we also assess for comorbidities when looking at risk factors for screening, such as fatty liver disease, obstructive sleep apnea, depression or anxiety, eating disorders, and conditions associated with insulin. Now we'll go a little bit into some uh, detail about management, um, preparing for more review of the medication changes, which Maggie will talk about in her section of today's presentation. And this information comes from the ADA 2022 standards of care. And as we all know, diabetes is a complex chronic illness requiring um, continuous medical uh, care with multifactorial risk reduction. And there's a lot of evidence that, is so, that supports a range of interventions to improve diabetes outcomes. And we've also learned in the last few years and the guideline revisions this year reflect this, that prediabetes also requires quite a bit of attention. It's associated with increased cardiovascular disease risk and mortality, and it's important to uh, emphasize interventions to prevent or delay the progression to type 2. So when you're looking at management, you should look at individual risk benefit, um, considering and screening intervention and preventing or delaying type two. So now this slide, I'm gonna go through it a little faster in the interest of time. This slide, the main takeaway for this is that the ADA is looking at ways to prevent or slow progression to type two diabetes. And they've done some studies and review of studies looking at various medications and supplements such as vitamin D at how to best um, prevent or slow the progression. And basically, go back. basically the takeaway in this is that metformin is, um, a, or excuse me, basically the takeaway for this slide is that if you have people with prediabetes or they have great diabetes risk, the ones that progress slower were the ones that had lower BMI. So we're still looking at the same intervention uh, emphasis as we did years ago, which was uh, BMI reduction and weight control. These are, this is just a listing of the ADA section standards and we were, uh, the ones that we were gonna discuss today are outlined um, in italics and underlined. This slide is a favorite of mine, especially when you're looking at pharmacological interventions with type two diabetes. It's a version of the ominous octet slide that we saw earlier, but it goes over all the various drug um, categories that, have, that are used to uh, intervene in certain pathways leading to hyperglycemia, and it affords us uh, more options for better control and reducing the risk of complications. So for example, in the pediatric world where I live, um, because of our age group of our population, we do not have the option to use a lot of the medications um, that are approved for over 18, ages over 18. So one of the medicines that we use quite often in our type 2 diabetes population is metformin. And, you know, metformin helps to reduce hepatic glucose output and also um, increases skeletal muscle uptake of insulin. This slide is a busy slide, and I, I always joke this is the infamous slide or a famous slide, however you want to look at it. It's figure 9.3 from um, the ADA guidelines, and uh, Maggie will go into some more detail about this, but um, basically what they've done this year is that they have focused on 
um, use of more targeted therapies at the onset and reduced um, emphasis on sequential add-on therapies. And this is the takeaway from that slide, basically looking at what are the best medications to use at the beginning of the diagnosis of diabetes rather than starting and adding and start and then adding second and third step. Another area of the 2022 ADA guidelines where there was more emphasis and attention this year was this particular figure. This is figure 4.1, decision cycle for patient-centered glycemic management in type 2 diabetes. And the emphasis is on preventing complications and optimizing quality of life for our patients. And we do this uh, every day when we interact with someone with diabetes, looking at what would be the best option for them, taking into account all of the pieces of their life, including support, lifestyle, financial considerations, and um, even things such as uh, insurance coverage. And then the most important thing that has been focused on this year is agreeing on a management plan as a team, the provider, as well as the patient. I'm just gonna go through some of this. Metformin was the medication that overall seemed to be most likely to help uh, delay or prevent the progression to type 2. So the takeaway for this is that in, again, people that have high risk, have prediabetes symptoms, uh, women with gestational diabetes history, um, that metformin is the medication with the most data to support its use and prevent or delay the progression to type 2 diabetes. In section 3.6 of the ADA standards, um, this is what they uh, decided to say that metformin is the best one in ages 25 to 59 years with BMIs above 35 and other indicators of prediabetes. In section 9.4a, first-line therapy depends on comorbidities, patient-centered treatment factors, and management needs, and again, generally includes metformin along with comprehensive lifestyle changes. In section 9.4b, they mention adding a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor uh, with or without metformin, and they, these may all be appropriate initial therapy for individuals with type 2 and have other risk factors. In cardiovascular uh, risk factor changes, um, Maggie will go into more detail about the medications involved, but the takeaway for this is basically being a little bit more aggressive in the revisions this year about diagnosing hypertension on, at a single visit if they meet this blood pressure criteria, and that um, using an ACE or an ARB um, may still be considered safe depending on the GFR. And um, also if you have type two diabetes and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, you may have cardiac benefit, additional cardiac benefit without kidney damage, adding an SGLT2 and a GLP1 to your, your medication regimen. And the takeaway on this information basically was um, the ADA standards looked at some studies with clotting and stroke risk with people with type 2 diabetes. And the uh, aspirin studies showed that an aspirin dose in patients with type 2 diabetes and risk of uh, cardiovascular disease or already present cardiovascular disease um, was lowered with a, an aspirin dose of 75 to 162 milligrams daily. And then uh, they did find that Repatha helped to decrease stroke risk in some patients with type 2 diabetes and Nexlitol also reduced LDL and that um, there was some improvement in uh, use of uh, taking aspirin out of the mix early in patients post coronary invasive treatments with type 2 diabetes. And in section 11, there were some updates regarding patients with type two and chronic kidney disease, adding in um, some potential uh, changes and recommendations based on urinary studies and GFR rates. And Maggie will address some of this in her section. Okay, we're gonna test our knowledge a little bit. 
So this is something that happens every day in my clinic. And all I did basically was change the age of the patient to make it an adult. This is a 35 year old female who comes in for her annual physical with complaints of fatigue and feeling funny after she eats. She was last seen about two years ago um, and was, has missed follow-up due to the COVID pandemic. Her weight's up 25 pounds since her last visit. Her BMI today is 35. Blood pressure is 130 over 88. Physical exam shows that she has acanthosis on her neck and knuckles. There's no family history of diabetes, no gestational diabetes with her pregnancies, no history of hypertension, but she reports that her family tends to gain weight easily. And she has some irregular menstrual cycles now. She states that she was told years ago she may have had PCOS, but she has not seen her gynecologist regularly. Prior to COVID, she had a job that required walking around most of her shift time, but now she's working from home and she's sedentary. So this is an easy question. Does she or should she be screened for diabetes? Yes, she meets the suggestive. Um, she meets the suggestive criteria on many, many points. BMI, sedentary lifestyle, age, um, possible history of PCOS. So now, and most of you out there are shaking your heads going, yes, 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 she absolutely positively should be screened. Now we need to figure out what would be the best screening method for her. OGTT, A1C, CMP, or a point of care glucose. So an OGTT, I have always loved OGTTs. They provide a lot of information. They give you your fasting blood sugar, as well as a two hour mark. The problem that we have with OGTTs is they require a separate appointment usually because your patient rarely walks into the office fasting and is willing to stay for two hours for, for the test. In pediatric world, we don't do many of these anymore for those reasons because we found a lot of our families won't come back for their scheduled testing day. Um, A1Cs are very good for screening and for diagnosis. We rely very heavily on A1Cs in our clinic. Um, point of care A1Cs are pretty much standard, I think, most in most clinics these days, but they're only as good as your machine accuracy and your calibration and your operator error. And even if you're using a point of care A1C or a serum A1C, you have to be aware of possible hemoglobinopathies that can interfere with your results. CMPs are helpful as well, but again, they must be fasting and, and there's a lot of uh, accuracy about that. And a point of care glucose can be helpful for screening, but for diagnosis, I don't know that I would use that um, depending on how accurate the test is. In this woman's case, we chose to do a point of care A1C because she mentioned in her history, she has transportation issues and childcare problems. Her A1C today is 5.9, so she has prediabetes. Now, all of us realize that we need to do something for her. So my goal in asking these questions will not necessarily say what is the best option, but to look at the considerations when you make your decision for figuring out the best option of treatment for her. And this goes back to figure 4.1, which is the decision cycle for, for your best patient care. And so I put up some um, criteria that we should all be using and our info emphasized in our uh, ADA guidelines this year about ways to make these decisions. Basically, things that help her get involved as, where, as well as her providers. And making sure you're using SMART goals and assessing her motivation for change. And her need for follow-up and further referrals and management. And obviously, if we decided to start a medication, you know, which would be the most appropriate medication? And you can think more about that as Maggie does her part of the talk. What would be your treatment choice? And again, this was where I was trying to point that there's a lot more to think about when you're making decisions about treatment with these patients than just this is the medication I think you should use. You have to take into consideration all of these factors when making the best uh, management choice. I would like to give special thanks to Michaela Paris, Emily Beckman, and Dr. Wintergerst for helping me get some slides together for this presentation today. And now I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Maggie Mangino. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. I thank Maggie, 
handing over. Perfect. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I'm going to focus on the pharmacologic management. Let's see. Sorry, I'm having a Zoom issue here. Oh. I apologize. I'm going to mess this. There we go. I'm going to focus on the pharmacologic management of diabetes in adults, starting first with a quick overview of treatment of type 1 diabetes, and then I'll spend much more time discussing the management of type 2 diabetes, particularly the newer drug classes and updates from the American Diabetes Association. As everyone is aware, the treatment of type 1 diabetes in adults, just like in pediatrics, is insulin. This can either be multiple daily injections with a basal insulin plus mealtime insulin with a correction dose, or insulin can be deliver, delivered through con continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion, also called insulin pumps. I wanna provide a quick review of the available insulin products, starting with the rapid acting insulins. So we have Lyspro, Aspart, and Glulacine. Insulin Lyspro and Aspart also have ultra rapid acting formulations, which have an even quicker onset of action and can be dosed right at mealtime. Regular insulin can also be dosed at mealtimes, but is less desirable than the rapid and ultra rapid acting insulin analogs as it's associated with a little bit more hypoglycemia and weight gain. NPH and long acting insulins can provide basal coverage with long acting insulins preferred as long as there are no financial barriers. These long acting insulins include Glargine, Didamir, and Degladec. And then we have the mixed basal bolus insulins as an option, but generally these are not preferred as they don't provide as much flexibility as a regimen of a long acting insulin plus a rapid acting insulin analog prior to each meal. Um, so these may re be reserved for people who have more limited options due to cost or who may be unable to do four injections a day and need a simpler two injection regimen. I also wanted to quickly mention regular U500 insulin, as we see it more commonly in adults with type 2 diabetes with high levels of insulin resistance. This is a more concentrated form of regular insulin. However, the pharmacokinetics are not exactly the same as regular insulin. So the onset and peak are like regular insulin U100, but the duration is a little bit more like NPH. Um, this is generally reserved for patients with extreme insulin resistance. Another major component of management of type 1 and even type 2 diabetes is the use of continuous glucose monitoring systems and insulin pumps. CGM systems are now considered a standard of care for most people with type 1 diabetes, and we're seeing them quite frequently in patients with type 2 diabetes as well. The CGM system monitors glucose in the interstitial fluid every five minutes and can display the glucose value and trend. Many of these devices can have low and high alert set to help prevent or help manage hypo or hyperglycemia. Some CGM systems are available as standalone systems so that even people are people using even just multiple daily injections can also use CGMs or they can be used in combination with an insulin delivery device. We're also now seeing a lot of use of automated insulin delivery systems, also called hybrid closed loop systems, which automatically increase or decrease insulin delivered from the pump based on sensor derived glucose levels. There are also sensor augmented pumps, which have the ability to suspend insulin when the glucose is low or predicted to go low. And then finally, we have the older, more traditional pumps that deliver insulin without automation. So people with this type of pump can still use a continuous glucose monitoring system, but they would have to manually make adjustments to the pump. It would not happen automatically based off of their sensor reading. So in summary of the previous several slides, the American Diabetes Association recommends a long acting insulin analog with either a rapid or ra ultra rapid acting insulin analog if using multiple daily injections, as this gives greatest flexibility and lowest risk of hypoglycemia for the injections. Insulin analogs are preferred as long as affordability and intensity of treatment are not barriers. However, when it's not cost prohibitive, an insulin pump with a hybrid closed loop system truly provides the greatest flexibility and lowest risk of hypoglycemia of all the insulin delivery options. <laughs> 
Now I'm going to shift to a focus on pharmacologic management of adults with type 2 diabetes. I'll start with a medication class overview of some of the newer drug classes and those with significant focus in the ADA guidelines. Um, first, I want to start, though, with a historical perspective of diabetes medications. So it's now been about 100 years since insulin was developed. And then it wasn't until about 30 years later that we had the introduction of sulfonylureas, and then another 40 years after that until metformin became available. And then in the 1990s, we also saw the development of alpha glucosidase inhibitors, TZDs, and aglutinines. And we don't have time to review all of the drug classes today, but I will spend some time reviewing the GLP-1 receptor agonists, which first became available in 2005, followed by the DPP-4 inhibitors. I'll also review the SGLT-2 inhibitors, as well as the novel GIP GLP-1 receptor agonists that just received FDA approval in May of 2022. I'll start with the glucagon-like peptide, or GLP-1 receptor agonist. I'm gonna give an overview of the medication class and then a summary of the key clinical trial showing cardiovascular and renal benefits leading to some of the updates in the ADA guidelines. The medication class consists of exenatide, liraglutide, dulaglutide, and semaglutide. They work by increasing insulin secretion and decreasing glucagon secretion. They also slow gastric emptying and increase satiety, which contributes to the weight loss associated with these agents. We can generally see about a 1% to 2% A1C lowering with these on average. Some people are going to see a bit more than that, and maybe some not quite as much. There are subcutane these are subcutaneous injections administered either daily or weekly, with the exception of semaglutide, which has an oral and a subcutaneous formulation. If the patient is already on insulin or on a secretagogue, a dose reduction of those agents may be necessary when starting the GLP-1 agonist to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia. Another important dosing consideration is that due to the lack of additive glycemic benefit and the potential theoretical increased risk of side effect, GLP-1 agonists are not recommended to be used concomitantly with DPP-4 inhibitors. These are contraindicated to anyone with a personal or family history of medullary thyroid car of cancer and should be avoided in patients with a history of pancreatitis. Also, due to the nature of the mechanism of action causing slowed gastric emptying, these should be used cautiously in patients with gastroparesis or potentially avoided altogether if they have severe symptoms of gastroparesis. The most common side effects are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal cramping. The nausea is dose-related and may improve over time, and that's why these all start with a low dose and a slow titration schedule. Um, there's also a caution with the subcutaneous uh, semaglutide and the potential for worsening retinopathy. This comes from the SUSTAIN-6 trial where they saw higher rates of retinopathy complications compared to placebo. Um, the effect was reported to be mainly observed in patients with pre-existing diabetic retinopathy, um, so just something to be aware of. Some GLP-1 agonists now may be considered first-line agents for people with type 2 diabetes with or at high risk of ASCBD, as well as for those with CKD without albuminuria. So on this slide, I'll quickly review the key trials demonstrating cardiovascular benefit. I won't have enough time to discuss a lot of the details of the trials on the next several slides, but I have additional information on the slides for your reference. Um, I'll mostly just highlight the key conclusions from each study. The LEADER trial included patients with type 2 diabetes with or at high risk of cardiovascular disease who were randomized to receive liraglutide or placebo. The SUSTAIN-6 trial included patients with type 2 diabetes plus either cardiovascular disease, heart failure, CKD, or people at high risk of cardiovascular disease. Patients were randomized to receive subcutaneous semaglutide or placebo. And then a rewind trial looked at dulaglutide versus placebo in patients with type 2 diabetes and vascular disease or those who are at high risk of cardiovascular disease. All three of these trials used a three-point MACE or major adverse cardiovascular events as the primary composite outcome, which included death from cardiovascular causes, non-fatal MI, or non-fatal stroke. Each of these three trials showed lower rates of the primary outcome compared to placebo. Each of these three trials also showed renal benefits in secondary outcomes. So in the LEADER trial, one of the secondary outcomes showed a lower rate of nephropathy events in the liraglutide group. 
and sustained six trial, they showed lower rates of new or worsening nephropathy in the semaglutide group. And the rewind trial showed a lower composite of the renal outcomes. So this is where some of the ADA recommendations come from, which we'll look at in a few more slides um, related to the cardiovascular and renal outcomes. The next class I'll review is the dipeptidyl peptase 4 or DPP4 inhibitors. This class includes citagliptin, saxagliptin, linagliptin, and alagliptin. They increase insulin secretion and decrease glucagon secretion. We generally expect to see about a 0.5 to 0.8 reduction in A1C on average. All of these are dosed orally once daily, and most do require renal dose adjustment, so something to monitor for. Just like with the GLP-1 agonist, this class should also be avoided in patients with a history of uh, pancreatitis. And then another precaution is with saxagliptin and the potential risk of heart failure. In the saver timmy saxagliptin trial, 3.5% of patients who received saxagliptin were hospitalized for heart failure versus 2.8% of patients who received placebo. And risk factors included a history of heart failure or kidney impairment. So this should likely be avoided in patients with heart failure, especially since there are other agents that have been shown to be beneficial in heart failure. Next, we'll review the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 or SGLT2 inhibitors class and the key clinical trial showing cardiovascular, renal, and heart failure benefits. The agents in this class include canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, empagliflozin, or, and ertugliflozin. The mechanism of action results in increased urinary excretion of glucose. We expect to see about a 0.5 to 1% lowering in A1C, as well as a weight reduction. Um, these are dosed orally once daily. Um, and I recommend looking at labels for renal dose considerations of each individual agent. The, in some cases, with an EGFR less than 30, initiation may not be recommended for glycemic control. However, it may be appropriate if the patient has diabetic kidney disease or heart failure. So for example, benefits of empagliflozin in 10 milligrams daily have been shown in patients with heart failure with an EGFR greater than or equal to 20. Canagliflozin has the potential risk of bone fractures associated with it, which comes from the CANVAS trial. Um, however, this was not shown in the subsequent CANVAS R and the Credence trials, um, so just something to note. Adverse effects include increased risk of yeast infections and UTIs and hypotension, but particularly when co-administered with diuretics, NSAIDs, or renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system inhibitors. The next several, sl several slides highlight key SGLT2 studies. Again, I don't have time to go into a ton of detail, but I've included some of that inf information on the slides for reference. In the IMPA-REG outcome study, Patients with type 2 diabetes with ASCVD who received empagliflozin as, as compared with placebo had a lower rate of the primary composite cardiovascular outcome, which was the three-point NACE. So that, that included death from cardiovascular causes, non-fatal MI, or non-fatal stroke. There were no between group, there were no significant between group differences in the rate of MI or stroke, but in the empagliflozin group, there were significantly, significantly lower rates of death from cardiovascular causes with a 38% relative risk reduction. We'll discuss some of the secondary outcomes of the study on the next slide. In the CANVAS trial, the rate of the primary composite outcome, which was also the three-point NACE, was lower in the canagliflozin group than placebo. And in the CREDENCE trial, the primary outcome included a composite of renal outcomes um, so we'll talk about that on the next slide, but a secondary outcome in this trial showed a lower rate of cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke in the canagliflozin group. So now moving into the evidence of renal benefits with select SGLT2 inhibitors. Some of the pre-specified secondary outcomes of the IMPA-REG trial focused on renal microvascular outcomes. And the author's overall conclusion related to the renal outcomes was that in patients with type 2 diabetes, and high cardiovascular risk, empagliflozin is associated with slower progression of kidney disease and lower rates of clinically relevant renal events compared to placebo. And as mentioned on the previous slide, the primary outcome of the CREDENCE trial was a composite of renal outcomes, and the relative risk of the primary outcome was 30% lower in the canagliflozin group than in placebo. And then finally, in the DAPA-CKD study, um, which included about 4,300 patients with an EGFR 25 to 75, 
a urinary albumin to creatinine ratio of 200 to 5,000 um, who received either dapagliflozin or placebo. And the main conclusion of this study was that among patients with CKD, regardless of the presence or absence of diabetes, the risk of the primary composite renal outcome was significantly lower with dapagliflozin compared to placebo. And lastly, we'll review the key trials supporting the use of select SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with heart failure. Another secondary outcome in the IMPA-REG study showed lower rates of hospitalization for heart failure with implagoflozin compared to placebo with a relative risk reduction of 35%. And the IMPA reduced and the IMPA preserved trials both included patients with New York Heart Association class two, three, or four heart failure with an injection fraction less than or equal to 40 in the reduced trial or greater than 40 in the preserved trial, and the primary composite outcome of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure was lower in both studies in the implagliflozin group compared to placebo, and this was consistent in patients with or without diabetes. Another secondary outcome of the CREDENCE trial, which we previously discussed, was a lower risk of hospitalization for heart failure in the canagliflozin group. The declare TEMI trial included over 17,000 patients with type 2 diabetes with or at high risk for ASCVD randomized to receive dapagliflozin or placebo. Treatment with dapagliflozin did not result in higher or lower rates of the three-point MACE compared to placebo but it did result in a lower rate of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure, a finding that was really reflected from the lower rate of hospitalization for heart failure. And then finally, the DAPA heart failure trial randomized about 4,700 patients with New York Heart Association class two, three, or four with a reduced ejection fraction to receive dapagliflozin or placebo. The risk of worsening heart failure or death from cardiovascular causes was lower among those in the dapagliflozin group. And that was also regardless of the presence or absence of diabetes. So the summary of recommendations that came from all these key clinical trials are very nicely summarized in table 9.2 from the American Diabetes Association guidelines. Note Kelly showed this slide as well. Um, I think this is a, a qu nice quick reference um, for practitioners to help identify which agents show benefit, potential risk, or a neutral effect for those with type 2 diabetes and ASCVD, heart failure, or CKD. Um, it also nicely summarizes the risk of hypoglycemia and weight gain, as well as other key can considerations when prescribing. And although this is not yet included in the ADA guidelines, since it just received FDA approval in May, I did want to quickly discuss the newest agent for type 2 diabetes which is a glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, or GIP, and GLP-1 receptor agonist combo, or it, all in one agent, called terzepatide. The effectiveness of terzepatide in adults with type 2 diabetes was established in five clinical trials, and in these, the reduction in A1C ranged from 1.7 to 2.4%. This medication also has results in weight loss in the SURMOUNT-1 study, which was a phase three randomized control trial, including about 2,500 patients with a mean BMI of 38 at baseline. The mean percentage change in weight at 72 weeks was a 15% decrease in the five milligram dose, a 19.5% decrease with the 10 milligram dose, and a 20.9% decrease with the 15 milligram dose all statistically significantly lower than placebo, showing that all doses provided substantial and sustained reductions in body weight. So I think we'll see more to come with this medication and the weight loss um, results and potential. Now that we've reviewed some of the newer drug classes and some important clinical trials, I'll move into the pharmacotherapy selection. The ADA used to recommend metformin as a first-line agent in combination with lifestyle modifications. Now, based on these cardiovascular, renal, and heart failure trials, they really recommend selecting the first-line agent based on comorbidities. So the guidelines now also recommend GLP-1 agonist over insulin when possible, with the exception that insulin should be introduced early if symptoms of hyperglycemia are present or if the A1C is greater than 10%. Um, Kelly also showed this slide too, which is just a very handy algorithm for quick reference from the ADA guidelines. 
I'll enlarge the left and the right sections on the next two slides as we talk about it a little bit more, but kind of wanted to give that overview. So if a patient has or is at high risk of having ASCVD, heart failure, or CKD, select GLP-1 agonists or SGLT-2 inhibitors are recommended regardless of a baseline A1C or regardless of metformin use. So specifically, if the patient has ASCVD, a GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT-2 inhibitor with proven cardiovascular disease benefit should be used. So based on the trials we discussed, this includes liraglutide, subcutaneous semaglutide, dulaglutide, empagliflozin, and canagliflozin. If the patient has heart failure, an SGLT2 inhibitor with proven benefit should be used. If the patient has CKD and albuminuria, an SGLT2 inhibitor with primary evidence and reducing CKD progression should be used, or potentially an SGLT2 inhibitor that showed evidence of reducing CKD progression in the cardiovascular outcomes trials. Uh, if the SGLT2 inhibitor is contraindicated or the patient can't tolerate it, then a GLP-1 receptor agonist with proven cardiovascular disease benefits should be considered. And then for patients with CKD but without albuminuria, either a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor with proven cardiovascular benefit uh, will be recommended. If patients do not have ASCVD, heart failure, or CKD, we should select agents that provide adequate efficacy to achieve glycemic targets and take into account patient-specific factors, such as the risk of hypoglycemia, or the need to promote weight loss, or cost or access considerations. So still for most people, metformin with comprehensive lifestyle modifications will still be the first line choice. But these other factors should be considered as well and should also be considered when additional therapy is needed. Another change in the updated guidelines is that prior algorithms really conveyed a sequential addition of therapy, whereas the newer guideline updates emphasize the importance of tailoring the regimen to the individual patient's needs and comorbidities, stating that not all treatment intensification results in sequential add-on therapy, but in some cases it may involve switching therapy or weaning current therapy. So for example, discontinuation of a DPP-4 inhibitor would be recommended when intensifying from a DPP-4 inhibitor to a GLP-1 receptor agonist, given the overlapping mechanisms. Another example is if a cardioprotective agent like the SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor agonist is, is added to the patient having ASCVD or CKD, another medication may need to be weaned or stopped depending on the current A1C, as opposed to always just adding another therapy. So that brings us to our first patient case. Um, so RW is a 52-year-old female with type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity, ASCVD, and history of MI. For diabetes, she's currently taking metformin extended release, 500 milligrams, two tablets twice daily, and citagliptin 100 milligrams. She reports adherence to her regimen. Her recent A1C trend shows um, A1C between 7.2 to 8.1 in the past year, with her most recent A1C of 7.4 from this month. Her renal function is stable. She's got an EGFR greater than 60. She has a commercial insurance plan, so hopefully there's a little bit less of a barrier in terms of like cost and access to medications. So based off of this, which would be, which of the following would be the best pharmacotherapy optimization? Um, a would be to continue metformin and citagliptin and initiate liraglutide 0.6 milligrams once daily. Continue metformin, but discontinue the citagliptin and initiate the semaglutide 0.25 milligrams once weekly. Option C would be to discontinue metformin and citagliptin and initiate dulaglutide once weekly or option D, continue metformin and citagliptin and initiate dapagliflozin 10 milligrams daily. Okay, so looking at the results, it looks like the majority of people selected option B. Um, a few people did also select option, option D, so we can kind of talk about a few of those. Um, so, to me, B is the correct answer. So because of her cardiovascular history, she should be on a GLP-1 agonist or SGLT-2 inhibitor with proven cardiovascular benefit, which has been shown with semaglutide. 
With the addition of the GLP-1 agonist, the DPP-4 inhibitor should be stopped due to the lack of additive benefit. Since her A1C is above target, she should remain on the metformin. So answer A is not the best choice because while it'd be appropriate to add the liraglutide, we would want to stop the citagliptin. Um, answer C is maybe not the best choice because while it would be appropriate to add the dulaglutide, we probably would not want to discontinue the metformin since our A1C is above seven. And answer D is not the best choice because while dapagliflozin did result in lower rates of hospitalization for heart failure, it did not lower the rate of major adverse cardiovascular events compared to placebo. The next algorithm from the ADA highlights treatment options when injectable therapy is needed. The, they recommend considering a GLP-1 receptor agonist um, in most patients prior to initiating insulin. If they are already on one or if a GLP receptor agonist is not appropriate and the patient is above A1C target, then basal insulin could be added and titrated using an evidence-based titration algorithm, such as increasing the basal insulin dose by two units every three days until fasting target is reached. If the A1C is still above target after optimizing a GLP-1 receptor agonist and or the basal insulin, mealtime insulin should be considered. And this table outlines specific recommendations for different approaches of how you could add that prandial insulin. So then that brings us to the last patient case. So that's LK, um, a 42 year old male with type two diabetes and hypertension. He presents for an initial visit to establish care. He was last seen by an outside provider eight months ago. He is currently prescribed implicable flows in 25 milligrams daily, insulin glargine 30 units daily, insulin aspar eight units before meals, and lisinopril 20 milligrams. Upon adherence discussion, patient reports missing doses of oral medications twice a week, um, insulin glargine about four times a week, and he generally only takes his insulin aspar with dinner. He's tried metformin, 500 milligrams once daily in the past, but it was discontinued due to GI side effects. His A1C today is 8.2, EGFR greater than 60, and his BMI is 48. So based off of this, which would be the best plan for pharmacotherapy optimization? So A, continue the infliclofloxacin, increase insulin glargine to 35 units, and continue the insulin aspart eight units before meals. B, continue current regimen and retrial metformin 1,000 milligrams twice daily. C, continue implicaflozin, discontinue insulin glargine and aspar, and start semaglutide 0.25 milligrams once weekly. Or uh, D, continue current regimen and add liraglutide 0.6 milligrams once daily. Okay, it looks like it was a uh, split 50-50 between answer C and D, so we can talk about those. Um, so I think answer C is the correct choice. Um, he's not adherent to his insulin regimen. His BMI is 48, so he would likely benefit from the addition of an agent to promote weight loss. Um, additionally, a once weekly injection may be better for him since he misses so many doses of his medications. Um, I always tell patients on once weekly medications to set a cell phone alarm reminder to go off on the same day every week to remind them to take it. Um, the ADA recommends considering a GLP-1 agonist before insulin when possible. And this is also an example of changing therapies based off of patients' needs as opposed to always adding on therapy. So A is not an optimal choice. I don't think anyone selected that uh, because he's not adherent to his current regimen. Um, so increasing the insulin dose could be problematic because if you improved adherence, it could cause hypoglycemia. Answer B is, no one selected that one either, is maybe not the best choice either because he did have GI side effects on, on the lowest dose of metformin in the past. And so while it may be appropriate to retrial with the extended release formulation, you probably wouldn't want to start at that high dose. You might want to start at a lower dose and try trade up. And I also still think adding a GLP-1 agonist to help with the weight loss since his BMI is so elevated would be preferred. And then answer D isn't wrong per se, but maybe not the best choice. He already has adherence issues with his daily insulin injection. So switching to a once weekly instead of a daily GLP-1 receptor agonist may be better. And I don't necessarily think um, he needs additive therapy to his insulin. I think uh, since he already wasn't really adherent to it, I think starting with changing to a regimen that he could be more successful at being adherent to would maybe first be the best um, option. Okay, so um, lastly, just a quick summary of kind of the newer updates to the guidelines. You know, the biggest thing being that first line, 
therapy for type 2 diabetes no longer must include metformin. Um, the emphasis now is to really select an agent based on those comorbid conditions or other patient-specific factors. Um, another key point is metformin should still be considered um, or continued upon initiation of insulin therapy for ongoing glycemic and metabolic benefits unless it's contraindicated or not tolerated. GLP-1 agonists are often are preferred over insulin if possible, and if insulin is used, combination therapy with the GLP-1 receptor agonist is recommended. And then lastly, not all treatment intensification results in sequential add-on therapy, and, it's, and instead may involve switching therapy or weaning current therapies to accommodate therapeutic changes. So that um, concludes um, our presentation. So I will turn it back over to Katie. Thank you, Maggie and Kelly. Appreciate uh, with a background in CT surgery, it's obviously um, important to me that we look at um, management of diabetes and we know that how it impacts really a lot of disease processes in the adult space. So better management, early management is something that we all need to be committed to. It, depend, it doesn't, shouldn't depend on our specialty, our primary care. So I appreciate the information you all shared with us today. I do have one quick question because you guys did a great job and we're almost at time. Um, do you find that patients um, have difficulty tolerating metformin since it's such, such an important um, treatment option here? Is, is that something that um, we run into, whether it be in the pediatric space or the adult space? And if so, any recommendations on it? Go first. <laughs> yes, it is a very, very big issue, especially in our pediatric population. And what we have tried to do over the years is um, use titration schedules for metformin, where you start with the lower dose and work your way up to optimal dosing, um, also helping to take the medication with meals. We've also had success using extended release versions as well. And so I would have to say compared to how my metformin use was 10 or 15 years ago in my practice, that the use of a titration schedule by far improves tolerance uh, much better than anything else I've ever tried. Okay, yeah, I know we, we prescribe things and we recommend things and then they leave the office and yeah. it really isn't successful. Man, they're not going to continue with yeah. the, the program. So Maggie, anything to add to that? No, the approach is really the same for the adult management as well. I mean, I, I, I think we hear about metformin intolerance a lot only because so many people are prescribed metformin. I do think more people tolerate it than don't. Mm -hmm. But where I see the biggest wins in improving tolerability is switching from the immediate release formulation to the extended release. That seems to be what makes the biggest difference for patients. But also like what Kelly said, a slow titration schedule and then emphasizing eating it are having it with their meals, particularly the largest meal of the day. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, I said I was only gonna ask one question, but I'm gonna ask a second one. Um, <laughs> the utility of an uh, pancreatic antibodies, and I've seen this in practice where you have a, B, a normal BMI, but an elevated hemoglobin A1C, and we go on managing what looks like a type two diabetes um, situation, but really we're missing that it could be type one. So Kelly, you mentioned pancreatic uh, um, antibodies. Do you recommend um, utilizing those um, in a 30, 40 year old who is trending to have pretty suspicious symptoms, but just kind of maybe comment on that because I've seen that missed. Well, unfortunately, with the pediatric obesity epidemic we've seen over the last decade or so, we had a lot of children misdiagnosed as type 2 that actually had type 1 because they came in and they were overweight or obese mm -hmm. into the ER. So that taught us a lesson very early on about not um, not looking in other directions if need be. And I would say in the adult population, um, it's important to consider checking antibodies if you have a younger adult, certainly you know below the age of 50, and there's a, lot, a big family history of autoimmune diseases. So you know I don't know an exact age cutoff, but I think in the 20s, certainly you can have people with type 1 diabetes present in their 20s who may also have um, you know a higher BMI. Okay, great. All right, I want to thank you two again for um, presenting and taking the time today.